My name is Erica James, Dean of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for joining us at our inaugural Beyond Business series. Beyond Business is an ongoing conversation that will explore the most complex and challenging problems facing individuals and organizations today. It's a three-part series shining a light on how systemic racism impacts business and society as a whole and ways it can be confronted. Our lecture series this year is devoted to the topic of race. There are three different lectures, and today I'm excited to be joined by friends and colleagues to talk about race and the entrepreneur. Today's conversation will explore the challenges that black entrepreneurs face due to important practices or unjust practices, rather, that limit their ability to shine in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Our subsequent series are on also topics but connected to race and business. Our second one is race and corporate power. We've all borne witness to the incredible philanthropy in recent months from companies focused on financial, operational, and strategic commitments made to combat systemic challenges facing the black community. And our third lecture series is Race and the Selling of America, which will explore the industries reconciling a complicated history with marketing through black culture, and why now is the perfect time for black influencers to raise their voice to create meaningful change and opportunity. Our Beyond Business series wouldn't be possible without the vision and commitment of the Tarnapal family. Mickey Tarnapal was a 1958 Wharton graduate and a global leader and vice chairman of the investment banking division of Bear Stearns. He and his wife Lynn have been ardent supporters over the years, uh, and this year we're devoting this series, the Tarnapal Lecture Series, to our new approach around Beyond Business. Today, as you know, we're talking about entrepreneurship and its intersection with race in, the, in this country in particular. But this is not the only thing that the Wharton School is doing connected to entrepreneurship. In February 2021, we will have our annual Whitney Young Conference, where our MBA students have been hard at work to create and relaunch the new venture competition, allowing opportunities for black founders in the early stage of their uh, startup to be in, in competition to potentially win as much as a hundred and seventy five thousand dollar support to launch their, uh, their to launch their new ventures more about the Whitney M Young conference will be forthcoming in the coming months so please keep an eye out for that important endeavor at this point it is my great pleasure to introduce our speakers uh, for the race and entrepreneurship discussion today. Josh Koppelman, Wharton grad from 1993 and managing partner of First Round, is joining us, as is Chris Bennett, 2007 Wharton graduate and co-founder and CEO of Wonder School. You should know that Chris is joining us from Honduras today, and 30 minutes before this session started, uh, the power went out, and so he is joining us by his phone, but we are very confident that the team at Wharton will ensure that there are a number of redundancies to keep him visible and uh, a, uh, all of us able to hear Chris while he's speaking. And then my colleague, Professor Carl Ulrich, who's joining us. Carl is the Vice Dean of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Wharton School, and he will serve as our moderator of Q&A during our session today. So just as an introduction to how things will unfold, I will start our conversation with Josh and Chris, have a handful of questions, and then Carl will come on to moderate a conversation with the audience. So as you hear things that um, spark your interest or raise a question for you, please use the chat feature, and we will be sure to engage you in conversation towards the latter half of this session. So welcome, Carl and Chris. Thank you so much for being here. My first question actually, Chris, is to you. Let's begin with your journey. Tell us a little bit about your own entrepreneurial pathway, how you got to where you are, and uh, what you would like us to know about Wonder School. Um, thank you for having me here, and uh, I'm really excited to, to, to speak with everyone. So my name is Chris Bennett. I'm the CEO of Wonder School. 
Um, my parents are from Honduras. Um, my parents are immigrants to the U.S. Um, I grew up in Miami, Florida, and um, I come from a, a family of entrepreneurs. So my uncle runs a hospital here in Honduras. Uh, my parents um, all started small businesses um, in Miami, and I got you know access to entrepreneurship at a really young age. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college, and uh, I applied to Wharton because uh, a Penn alum in Miami, who uh, was a good friend of mine's uh, mom, recommended I consider Wharton because uh, I'm interested in business. And so I went to Wharton, um, graduated in 2007, and uh, after graduating, I worked in private equity at a firm called Heitman in Chicago for two years. And then after that, I moved to the Bay Area, and I've been in the Bay Area for about 10 years. And I started Wonder School um, primarily because I kept hearing from my friends that they were having a hard time finding childcare. And I personally experienced the benefits of high-quality childcare as a kid and um, started the company. I've been running it for the past four years. We've raised um, over you know, $20 million. Josh Koppelman is one of our investors um, and sits on the board. And um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, the only other thing I'll add is Wonder School is a network of high quality early child uh, care programs based out of people's homes. And we work with folks who are running programs that are in parks now. And um, we're all over the United States. Thank you. Well, congratulations on your success. I'm wondering if you've seen uh, an, an uptick in light of COVID with the demand for Wonder School. Yeah, it's a great question. So. In March, we actually saw a big decrease in uh, interest in Wonder School programs. Um, so parents all over the country were pulling their children out of child care programs and bringing their children in home to their you know, homes because of fear of getting exposure to COVID. Um, and then probably for about three months, we've really been rethinking our model and thinking about how we're going to respond to these times. And I would say over the past two to three months, we've seen a pretty massive uptick in interest. And we launched a micro school solution uh, about two months ago to support folks who are starting pods and folks who are starting child care uh, programs for child care for children over the age of five. We're seeing a lot of interest there. And then we're also getting a lot of interest from governments and from employers who are looking for support with child care these days. So that's something we're focused on as well. So, Josh, I want to bring you in in just a moment, but one more follow-up question for you, Chris. Uh, it sounds as if once you're established as a pretty solidly running company, uh, things continue to grow and there's some momentum behind you. But tell me about those first few <laughs> months or years as you were developing the concept for Wonder School and how did you get it to this, to this point and, and what are some of the advantages or, or challenges that you confronted? So what's interesting about Wonder School is Wonder School is uh, essentially the, the second concept that um, I, I brought to market as a CEO. The first concept was a company called Soulzy. And uh, I started Soulzy in 2011 um, with my co-founder. And um, starting that was really challenging. It was really hard. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have much of a network in the technology world. so. There were a lot of things that I didn't know about building a company, about fundraising, about recruiting, about building a product that I frankly learned just figuring it out through trial and error um, and eventually was able to raise you know, our first round and then our, our series A and start to grow the company. Um, when it came to starting Wonder School, I had the benefit of starting Soulzy and going through a lot of those learnings and um, also had the benefit of already having investors because we pivoted Soulzy into Wonder School. Um, so Josh is, Josh is on the board, was on the board of Soulzy, on the board of Wonder School. And, um, you know, we, we were fortunate to be able to work with Josh and, and to, to learn from him, but also to have um, investors who are interested in, in funding uh, the concept, uh, uh, primarily because, you know, uh, it's a strong idea, but secondly, because of the experience I was able to garner starting Soldi and, uh, and the confidence investors had in, in me being able to 
fundraise in the future, um, recruit uh, employees, and uh, you know bring the concept to market. Thanks, Chris. So, Josh, I know that you've known Chris for quite some time, and you've been an advocate and supporter of him personally and also his business. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you saw in either the idea or in Chris as a founder and, and CEO that wanted you to make the investment. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Happy to be here, Dean James. First, let me just say I think it's great that we're, you're running these type of uh, lecture series. Um, when I think back to first meeting Chris, he was fundraising for Solzy, which was a e-commerce uh, via social network uh, business. And I think what attracted us most to the opportunity was the depth to which Chris had gone deep on the problem. He truly understood the market landscape. He understood all of the competitors. And the speed of iteration of experiments that he was running um, it was just really impressive. He was just like constantly finding signal and just pulling that thread and getting closer and closer to sort of delivering great product to consumers. And we saw the same thing when he when when, when he chose to pivot to Wonder School, the 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 idea of tournament process that he ran, the the intellectual honesty of what's known and what's not known. Um, he he's he's just a a, a very sort of fact based. Um, product first thinker, and, and we were really drawn to that. So Josh, you've been in this domain for quite some time, and you have seen a number of entrepreneurs come and go, and some you've chosen to, to work with and invest in, and others you've not. And there's also clear evidence and longstanding evidence that women and people of color oftentimes don't have the same access to the networks and to the capital uh, that Chris has benefited from. I'm wondering what you've seen over the years uh, about why you think that might be the case and what we might do differently to help support uh, entrepreneurs to have the kind of experience that Chris has been having. Sure. So look, while the venture industry is seen as an industry whose superpower is to see trends early uh, and imagine alternate and better futures, I think when it comes to racial equity, the, the venture industry has been a laggard, not a leader. Um, and, and, and to be transparent, I'm not just pointing out a failure in others in my industry. I recognize that my own firm could have and should have done more to improve. So I feel like it's important to acknowledge this because I, the, the reason that I want to say that the reason I'm here is not because I, or first round, are holding ourselves up as a, of an example of someone that's done everything perfect, but rather to acknowledge that like these issues are important and they should be acknowledged and discussed, and VC shouldn't hide from the conversation. Um, you know, I think that um, what venture I think venture firms in general have all sort of you know, as, the, as systemic racism has sort of come into the spotlight, venture firms um, have all sort of realized they needed to, they need to do more. Um, and, have, and have sort of, many of them have written statements, begun action plans. Sort of the three that resonate the most with me are sort of focusing on making the hire, sending the wire, and building a bigger tent. Um, and I see a lot of people doing that uh, across multiple firms. Making the hire is making sure that your team is representative of the country and the industry that, um, and, and so you're striving to diversify the team. Sending the wire is what can you do to in, increase the number of fantastic entrepreneurs like Chris in your portfolio and build a bigger tent. It's all about network effects. So much of the industry is relationship-based. So the goal is to try to find ways to make more connections with and within um, uh, the, the, the black, indigenous, people of color, BIPOC community. Thank you. So, Chris, I, I saw some head nodding there and some affirmation to what Josh was saying. Tell us a little bit about the experience that you have or, or ways that you have personally either experienced what um, Josh has communicated or not that have, has contributed to your experience. Well, if I, I just I think about what's going on in Silicon Valley right now, and uh, I'd, I'd say the 
or, or just in technology or in entrepreneurship period. I, I think that there's the conversation around diversity, the conversation around increasing access to, to um, you know, black founders is happening. Um, when I came to the Valley in 2011, uh, I started a nonprofit called Black Founders because um, I wanted to connect with other black, I, I did it primarily for myself, frankly, because I wanted to connect with other black founders. And I wanted to build relationships with other black founders because it's definitely a shared experience and it's a unique mm-hmm. experience. And, um, and I remember it being sort of like a radical idea like why? Why are why do you why are you sort of self segregating? Why why does this only for black founders? Uh, and and now you know it's a it's a very I think it would be widely accepted today if if we were to start today, which was which is actually really exciting. Um, uh, and and I and I think that the the sort of the thinking within the community is starting to change, and that's being driven by what's happening across the nation. Um, that's being that's happening due to conversations that are that are happening within boardrooms, within uh, uh, within partner meetings, within within leadership teams, within companies, um, and and uh, the idea of wire and hire that that Josh mentioned, I, I think, is totally spot on. Uh, it's it's uh, it's really simple. Like invest in more uh, people of color. Um, hire more people of color, uh, in, invest in the careers of people of color, uh, that has a really long lasting effect and I think will play a big role in uh, changing the narrative that, that, that uh, you know, exists in the tech community today. So Josh, some, some could argue that it's really not race that has kept the VC community from wanting to make investments in black entrepreneurs, but that it's the lack of familiarity and the perceived risk associated with doing that because there's not been as much of a track record of black entrepreneurship. What do you say to that um, concept and, and what might we do going forward to create this sense of comfort and willingness to, if this is true, in fact, to, to take the risk uh, on black entrepreneurs without having the same kind of um, track record or longevity that we see with white entrepreneurs? Yeah, so what's, what's interesting here is venture capitalists typically talk about how they seek out contrarian ideas and like making contrarian bets. Yet. I think that many of us really fall victim to pattern matching around what makes a strong entrepreneur. And when you pattern match, it's really bad at contrarian or different things um, because you're, you're matching off of, um, off of a set of patterns. And, and so, you know, you know, what I think has happened is you you see an industry that sort of pattern matches. Did they go to an elite school like Wharton? Do did they work at Stripe or Airbnb or Uber? But these aren't the only predictors of success. And I think that as an industry, we need to think more creatively and open-mindedly about what makes for a good founder. Um, you know, one of the lenses that we often use is I think that in general society raises kids on a conveyor belt of conformity, um, right? Like they're told this is what you need to do to succeed in school or you show up your first day of class and the, the, the professor gives you a syllabus, which is a roadmap for the class. Here's, you know, here's what you need to read. You don't have to guess. Here's when you need to do it. Here's the cheat codes for the class because like class participation is 30% and final is 50%. So like you have to be a good map follower, um, to succeed, um, but when you start a business, no one tells you what to read. When you start a business, no one tells you when to read it, and no one tells you what winning looks like. And so in my experience, the best founders um, are comfortable going off map. They're comfortable uh, being cartographers drawing their own map. And I think that that is a, you know, that, you don't find that on LinkedIn. No one puts on whether they're a map follower or a map drawer, a cartographer. But like, if you actually take the time to get to know founders, you and you understand their life journey, you under. I think you could get a sense of of are they comfortable 
in a non-conformist role? Are they comfortable building their own map? And, and if you're able to do that, I think you'll be, you know, investors might be able to see beyond the patterns that they've historically matched for. What you've described is true in so many circumstances, certainly not just uh, the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Chris, I'm curious uh, how you would respond to Josh and what you think about uh, the, the notion of sort of being rule followers versus contrarians and what, what did people see in you, do you think, that allowed for your success? Yeah, what's, what's really interesting about not being a rule follower, um, at least for me, is it's actually very terrifying because you, you, you're, you're seeing, you're seeing um, folks go down a certain path and you're just like, I don't think that makes sense. Like it, it, it almost, you just have this like really strong gut feeling like it doesn't feel right. But everyone you trust, everyone you know, everyone you care about believes a certain thing. So it, it's really hard to actually go off path. I experienced this at Wharton when I was a when I was a sophomore in college. When I was a sophomore, I started a company called Liquid Books um, with uh, one of my classmates, um, Sam Durante. And uh, when, within a year, we were both making fifty thousand dollars a year, like net to us. And I remember uh, going, remember no junior year. Uh, going to pick up one of the, going to pick up some textbooks from one of my classmates. And she's like, Chris, what are you doing this summer for your internship? It was like, uh, I was going to just run my company. I don't know. And I, mind you, I'm first generation. So like, I don't even know what you're supposed to be doing. And she's like, Chris, you need to get an internship. You need to go work at a bank. I was like, really? <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> and so I got a job uh, at a real estate private equity firm. And, uh, and then I remember senior year, I'm running my company and everyone's going to get a job. And I had this company I likely could have scaled. I didn't. I just shut it down. I just shut it down and took a job. And uh, and I remember after taking that job and realizing that, you know, that career path didn't make sense for me, um, I, I, I kept telling myself that I really need to fight the urge of following the tried and true path and really um, focus on, you know, trusting my intuition. And frankly, I spend so much time and energy working on that because it's, it's very scary to do that. Entrepreneurship is so lonely, isn't it? Like you're, you know, it's so... When, you know, when everyone's going in one direction on the conveyor belt to step off and to walk the other way, it's just really, it's, it, it's hard. And it's not just hard when, at, when you start, it's always hard. So Josh, you and I have talked about this. And one of, I think, the ideas that you have um, surfaced with me is that for some individuals who come from you know, backgrounds where there's a safety net if, it, uh, if the idea doesn't work out, it feels less risky for them to sort of try and be contrary and, and, and go against the conveyor belt uh, because there's a, either a family safety net or some other set of resources that will allow them to be secure. And that's not always the case, and it hasn't always been the case, certainly for people of color. Uh, you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I wouldn't put myself as an expert in that, but I know that I, I also started a company at Wharton when I was an undergrad. Um, but I was privileged in that I had a safety net. I knew that I was not graduating with student debt, and I knew that um, if, if my company did not succeed, I would be okay. My family would be able to take care of me and there would not be an issue. And, and I think that I didn't realize at the time how valuable that safety net was. Um, because, the, you know, as Chris talked about, um, not only do you have to, when you, when you graduate a school like work, not only do you have to choose to sort of start a company, but you also have to choose to turn down uh, w another career path, right? Like there's an amazing recruiting apparatus at, at schools like Wharton and it's and it's an amazing it's an amazing asset for the for the student population but when you have big banks and the Goldman Sachs and the JP Morgan and the consultancies all coming on to recruit 
No one recruits for entrepreneurship. No one is selling against that. So I think you have the challenge of sort of no one is selling entrepreneurship. And you have, uh, you know, especially if you're first generation or low income, you, 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 ha you, you know, the lack of a safety net makes it even more scary to start companies. And, and for years, I, you know, I, I, I would meet with, uh, with founders through Wharton's, uh, you know, entrepreneur in residence program. And, you know, and all too often, I, 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 those founders look like me. And, 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 and I think a part of that is because, you know, they, they, whether consciously or unconsciously, benefit from having that safety net. I know Monique Woodward has referred to it as like the gap which is just sort of a lack of wealth connections and which which makes it really hard to go to, to get started and it's even harder in environments when the opportunity cost is so large like at Wharton. Yeah. So I want to talk about initial funding and how that manifests and what's required to uh, solicit funds to, to get a company off and running. So we know that for many entrepreneurs, uh, it is the friends and family plan, and they go and, and hold the hand out to mom and dad or to their grandparents and say, all I need is X to get up and running. What are other mechanisms by which new entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs who might not have friends and family in a position to contribute, how does one get started with the initial funding? And Josh, let me start with you, and then uh, Chris, want your your experience. Sure. So I think the real answer is, it, you know, it's hard to raise money. Um, it's never been easier than it is right now, but it's still not easy. It's still hard, um, and and especially when you're faced with that day zero gap that we talked about, like the lack of connections and fa friends and family capital. Um, it makes it really challenging. That said. 15 years ago, first round was one of five seed funds in the country. 10 years ago, we were one of 50. And now there are over 1,000. Um, again, not saying it's easy to raise money, but there are far more sources of capital than ever before. And you're seeing angels come around. But so like, again, businesses are great. On campus, you're seeing programs like Dorm Room Fund, which first round partner uh, uh, funds, or Rough Draft, uh, which is another program to provide funding for student entrepreneurs. And even and, and even sort of founders of color, you're now seeing whole funds get created solely focused on that because that those VCs recognized a huge market opportunity and ignored customer base. Right. Um, and, and so whether it's Arlen Hamilton at Backstage or Jared or Henry at, at Harlem Capital or LaDante and Ivan at New Age Capital, Sean Mendy at Concrete Rose, you see a lot of funds that have gotten started solely focused on founders of color. And I'd say the other thing for people that don't have networks, accelerator programs, whether you're talking about Y Combinator, Techstars, Dreamit, there are accelerators in almost every major city in the country. And accelerator programs are really, really powerful at creating, at trying to sort of create access to networks. So Chris, let me turn it over to you. Can you walk us through your experience with initial initial funding sources? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the first round I raised was um, out of an accelerator named 500 Startups uh, in 2011, 2011-2012. Uh, and uh, as Josh mentioned, it was incredible for, for access to a network. It was incredible uh, uh, in terms of access to uh, investors to, to invest in our round. And then um, we raised a, a seed round from a uh, crowdfunding platform called Funders Club. Uh, and uh, that was our seed round. And then um, first round capital led our Series A at Solzy. Um, and then for Wonder School, our seed round was led by first round capital. Um, and the only, thing, the only thing I'll add is that uh, um, Another thing that I'm seeing in the ecosystem that is really uh, changing the game for folks who are raising their first round is the creation of scouts. So um, a lot of uh, VC firms are, uh, uh, you know, funding angels effectively to go make their own uh, investments on behalf of the VC firm, and uh, that is created a lot more, uh, you know, investment capital in the in the earliest stages of a company. 
So as the entrepreneur, Chris, help me understand, is all money good money? And how do you decide which of those uh, options you will pursue, whether you'll go the accelerator route, whether you'll go through an angel investor? How, how, as the entrepreneur, how do you even know where to begin, much less what the pitch should look like to be attractive? Uh, you usually figure out where to begin based off of a network. Like you need to talk to other entrepreneurs who have gone through the process to, to sort of guide you. Um, and so what I typically recommend to folks who are starting a company for the first time is surround yourself with as many entrepreneurs as possible. Um, investors, in, you know, you know no, no matter how important they are to the ecosystem, don't really understand as much the early stages of getting that company to getting, figuring out how to, to pitch your company uh, as much as an entrepreneur does because, you know, entrepreneurs are doing it day in, day out. Uh, other, thing I the other thing I recommend heavily are, are um, accelerators. Accelerators can be very, very helpful for the network, but also helping your company um, get to the early stages of product market so that you can raise um, your, your, your first round. Uh, Josh, would you add anything to to that as being on the flip side of this now? No, I think I think Chris Chris pretty much summarized it. I think that um, you know there tends to be a sequence, right? You might have accelerator, scouts, angels, then seed funds, then multi stage funds. So so um, you know, and and for Chris's first company, he went through an accelerator. For the second company, he didn't need that. He already had the network, the experience, and he was able to go straight to the seed to a to a to an early stage round. Okay, so let's talk about mentoring entrepreneurs. And Josh, you certainly have done that throughout your life. How do they make a difference? What what advice? What counsel? How do you mentor an up and coming entrepreneur? So I think, look, I look back at the impact that some mentors had on my life, and it was tremendous. Um, oftentimes, mentorship provides more than just the answers, right? You're not just going to a mentor because you have a question and he or she may have the answers. Like a mentor is good at helping you organize your thoughts, helping you realize uh, that you're, you're, you're not the first person to sort of be dealing with this. Um, a mentor might not know the answer, but might help be able to connect you to resources or people that do know the answer. Um, you know, you know, I, we run a program at First Round called Fast Track, where we now connect. Um, we've done it with thousands of employees at the companies we funded with mentors. So someone who might be like in a similar function, but a few years ahead of them in their career. And what we're just finding is that um, even though it's a 90-day program, those relationships, most of them last longer than the program. Like you, you, you build a genuine connection. You're trying to find someone um, who can help you maybe see around corners, um, someone where you don't have to question. Oftentimes between an investor and an entrepreneur, you, it, it's somewhat hard to be vulnerable um, you know, and express doubt. As a, but you don't, you don't have that same limitation with with a mentor, um, so so I, you know, I, I I find that like just one or two mentors at the right time, I know in my life played an amazing had an amazing impact. Yeah. So just for a note for the audience, we're going to turn it over to the questions from the chat momentarily. So please uh, send questions in if you haven't already. And Chris, before we move on, I just want to go back to you. Tell us about maybe one or two people who just had a profound experience or impact for you as, as an entrepreneur and whether or not you are also paying that forward by supporting and mentoring others. Yeah, um, I, I feel very fortunate to have had, um, to have, you know, really incredible mentors. Um, uh, you know, three that come to mind, Josh, you know, has been an incredible mentor for me. And I'm not just saying that because he's on the panel today. Um, but, uh, no, but, you know, he, <laughs> I'm really not. Uh, you know, Josh has been an incredible mentor. When I, when I started Wonder School, when I started Soulsy, I made a point to go back to the Penn Network 
and try to tap into the Penn network again because of that shared experience. And, um, you know, a couple of folks that come to mind, Alex Matal, who started Funders Club, Felicia Kikura, who um, was one of the first employees at Funders Club. They were really helpful in helping me understand how to, you know, get ready for a seed round. Josh has been really instrumental in helping um, us raise our Series A and think about our company and then pivot the company into Wonder School. Um, and it's interesting. A lot of the, my closest mentors have been on my have been on our board. So there's a gentleman named Charles Hudson who runs a firm called Precursor Ventures, and he was on the board at Soldzi. And I reached out to him within like two weeks of moving to the Valley, and he met up with me, and he's been mentoring me ever since. Um, and uh, he's no longer on our board, but he's been you know really involved in in my career, and it's been really helpful. So I want to just fast forward for a moment, and this will be my last one or two questions before we bring on Professor Ulrich. Josh, if you look down five or ten years from now, both from the VC world and from the entrepreneurs, particularly black entrepreneurs, what do you? What's your prognosis? What do you? What do you see happening? So I hope that the attention and spotlight that has been that it, that has been shined on on the systemic racism and inequity doesn't diminish. I, I hope we don't, as an industry, take our foot off the gas pedal. Um, you know, and it's hard to sustain that. Um, which is why I think that you know the most immediate things that funds like First Round and others could do and uh, should do and must do are make the hire and send the wire because as the team, if you're willing to change your team um, to be more representative, if you're willing, if your portfolio um, is more representative and inclusive, um, you know I think it 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 that's what creates the cycles. You know, I look back to to a to, you know like to lessons that you learn. I, you know, I uh, we recently funded a, a company, Naza Beauty. It was started by Natanya Montgomery. And if I'm being honest, when 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 Natanya first pitched the idea, when we first heard it, I didn't get it. I thought she was just opening a few hair salons. And I was ignorant about the scope of the problem she was trying to solve, and I was too quick to dismiss that which I didn't know. And I, I, I think I let my ignorance and bias prevent me from doing the work I, I, I should have done to learn about powerful market dynamics, to the trends towards natural hair, the size of the black hair care market, the, the, the in, dis dissatisfaction with the current salon experience. Fortunately, another one of my partners was able to step in and push back and challenge me. Um, but I think that we all need to get comfortable um, recognizing, like, uh, we're all, a, the way we make decisions is as a result of our past experiences, our life story, and our biases. And, 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 the, you know, and if you're able to sort of build more diverse teams, teams that can sort of provide challenge questions and push back, um, I think that's a positive for everyone. And I think that like those are the types of things that the industry needs to do on a continual basis. So as someone who has spent a lifetime dealing with black hair, I'm going to want to follow up with you on Natalie's company. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris, Last question is for you before we turn it over to the audience Q&A. What would you like to see happen in the next five or 10 years to advance black entrepreneurship? Uh, you know, whether it's me or another black entrepreneur, it's take, a, take a company public. I think that's going to be uh, really, really, uh, you know, important um, for the ecosystem. And so that's what I'm really you. focused on. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that's that's what that's what that's I think that'll be huge. I think that'll be huge. And it's and it's only a matter of time. And so I'm really excited about that. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you both. This was the first part of our, our conversation, and now I'd like to invite my colleague, Carl Ulrich, to uh, take us the rest of the way. Thanks, Erica. This has a, been a terrific discussion, and thanks, Chris and Josh, for sharing your, your thoughts. Um, Chris, I got a huge number of questions here from the audience, but I want to start with a question that we can't let pass, which is you have your feet in two worlds, well, in many worlds, but one is in Honduras, where you're sitting right now. Um, <clears throat> and you said you came from a family of entrepreneurs and cited all these people in Honduras. Um, blacks are even less represented in, in Honduras than in the United States, at least as I under, understand the, the ethnic makeup of, of Honduras. Talk, contrast a little bit the Honduran experience and the American experience, and also that of the black immigrant, that the more recent immigrant uh, 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 to the United States. Um, so if I, I think the numbers, I think the black community in Honduras is you know, under 5%, um, and it's and it's very, very marginalized. Um, and uh, yeah, my, my parents came to the U.S. because they knew that they weren't going to be able to have the, the success. They, they had a higher chance of success for themselves and for their children um, in the U.S. Um, and you, you, you see even less sort of uh, black success here in Honduras. There's, you know, it's, it's really sad. Uh, and, and my uncle, who's a black man, is a pretty incredible uh, success story to, to grow up in the same situation my parents grew up in. My dad, for example, he didn't even graduate, he didn't even go to high school. And my, my uncle, um, you know, was able to, his mom was a teacher, uh, his, his is able to, he played soccer, for the, the professional team here, and then and use those use that money to fund his medical education. Um, realized he wasn't going to be able to realize uh, realize his full potential if he just stayed as a you know kept working as a doctor within the system, primarily due to racism, and decided to start his own hospital. And now he runs two hospitals, employs 350 people. His daughter is a doctor. His son is a lawyer and works at the hospital. His other daughter is a doctor and works at the hospital, um, you know, and seeing seeing him, you know, achieve that level of success through really hard work and perseverance, despite all of the, you know, uh, racism he experienced is probably one of my biggest motivations um, when I'm going about my work on a daily basis in, in, in San Francisco. Um, so, you know, being a black man in San Francisco or in the, in, in the United States, you know, personally, I believe, I, you know, you have access to a lot more um, opportunity, um, even with all of the, you know, challenges that we have in the United States um, relative to a country like Honduras. Um, is that, does that answer your question, Carl? Is there anything else I, yeah, I missed? And then, and then just a quick follow on. I'm super curious about what it was like to grow up in Miami as as a black man, as a black young man, um, and how you were perceived as an immigrant, and whether that immigrant or as a child of immigrants, and whether that was a very different experience as a uh, relative to entrepreneurship. Yeah. So what's interesting about Miami is Miami is incredibly diverse. So I actually grew up in the fiftieth most diverse zip code in America. So um, in my in my neighborhood. Uh, you know, there is a mixture of everyone. Uh, and I got exposed to a ton of different cultures um, um, as, as a kid. And then I also went to a high school um, that was made to uh, desegregate the area. So I grew up in a very diverse neighborhood, but there was a, a, a white neighborhood, a black neighborhood, and a, a Latin uh, neighborhood. And our school was roughly split right in the middle, 33% of each. And as a kid, you don't realize, at least I didn't realize the intention of the school district and creating this, the, the, the system that you know I was a part of. So I just thought that's what America looked like. I thought that's what America was. I, I always just thought that America was diverse and frankly integrated. Um, and, uh, and when you go to Penn, you know, it's very similar. It's a very integrated, uh, very diverse school. 
And it wasn't until I moved to Chicago that I realized the, the deep, deep segregation that exists within American society and how, um, you know, uh, how the color of your skin plays a big role uh, in the, the, the types of experiences you, you have from an economic standpoint and from a, from a social mobility standpoint. And then I, I actually had to go back and do a ton of research and learning to uh, really um, understand the forces at play. Um, so, you know, growing up in Miami, it was, you know, I, I, it was very challenging still because there's a, uh, uh, within the, within, within, within Miami, the black community is very marginalized still, and they're still, um, really difficult to, to achieve the outcomes that are, you know, desired. But, um, but, uh, it was a really unique experience. Great. Thanks so much. Josh, let me turn it to you. There has been uh, research, I think uh, some of it at Wharton, about unconscious bias among in venture investing. And, and I know you guys at First Round do a lot of your own research. And I think if I recall a First Round study, there is a, a legitimate arbitrage opportunity. That is, we are underperforming if we apply that bias. And so I guess the question uh, that I want to ask, synthesizing a few from the audiences, are there some mechanical, almost mechanical process changes that we can make in the way we manage the venture business um, yeah. that would allow us to mitigate that bias? Yeah. I think you could reduce it. Um, um, and it's not just unconscious. There are all types of biases uh, that, that come in. Um, like, again, we all bring life experiences, our views of the world, and they inform the decisions we make. I think research shows that the best way to mitigate biases um, is to be grounded in process and metrics rather than just trusting your gut. So one of the things, for example, we do at first round is after a founder evolves over time, we're constantly evolving, but after a founder comes in and pitches, um, we don't talk about it. We each fill out a scorecard, a rubric, where each partner evaluates a number of criteria that we previously had determined were important. Um, and only after every partner fills that out do we then have the conversation. We want to eliminate the bias that what happens if a senior partner says X, does that change something? We want it, and we want and, and we think that it's meant to make explicit what might historically have been implicit in the decision making process. And it could reduce both bias and noise uh, in that, um, you know, and reduce intuition and gut. So that's one thing we've done. We've done like checklists, rubrics, defining in advance what's important, so you could then apply it consistently afterwards. Another thing we've yeah. done are premortems. Oh, go on. Did you have another question, Carl? No, I wanted to just quickly follow up on that. But when someone pitches. Is there any hope of being colorblind in terms of the way when you evaluate uh, 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 a pitch deck, for instance? I mean, that's something that's advised in hiring, that you scrub the resume so that you're really looking at the credentials. Is there any hope of that? Is, there, is that something you could do in venture? Yeah. So we have not found an effective way to do that. that I, don't, I don't want to say there's not any hope. You know, we've all seen the study of the violin of, of the orchestra where they, you know, where they recruit behind the curtain and it and it transforms. So like I think it would be arrogant and a lot of hubris for for venture firms to say that they don't have the biases that every other uh, every other folks. I think the challenge here is that so much of what you're betting on when you're when you're betting on the business is how a founder might respond in the future, right? So much is unknown. And, and so it's really hard, you know, we, you could show me Wonder School without Chris and I wouldn't have funded it. Um, and because yeah. so much of what made Wonder School so exciting is Chris's ability to build it. So I think it, sometimes it's really hard to separate the leader or the founder or the person that's going to will this thing into existence from the idea. Yeah, great. Uh, it's possible to try to come up with criteria in advance that might signal what makes a strong founder or what you look for in a founder or what you don't look for in a founder. Mm -hmm. So that way 
you're not just trusting your gut or uh, 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 when it comes to, oh, he or she is going to be a good founder. No, you're saying he or she might be a strong founder because they spiked in these four areas that we previously had agreed on are signals of strong founders. So that might be a way to reduce some of the bias, but not necessarily. Yeah. I've yet to see a good, truly blind, uh, founder blind way to evaluate. Great. All right, Chris, back to you. It's really a question about whether at Wonder Schools you're eating your own dog food. And so are you, I mean, your, your, your company is clearly has a mission and that mission is likely to help uh, have a, has societal benefits, but I wonder to what extent you're modeling best practices in Wonder School around diversity and inclusion, if you can just speak to that. Oh, I see. Um, so, the, you know, the way, we've, the way we've thought about diversity and inclusion at Wonder School it's, it's, it's interesting. It, it, it hasn't, I'd say Wonder School has primarily been one of the most, like one of the more diverse companies in the Valley, um, you know, based on what I see from my peers and what I see in, in other companies. And I, I think a lot of it is being a black founder. I'm, I'm able to attract talent uh, from diverse backgrounds, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not, not sure. And then, but, uh, you know, our leadership team is one, me, uh, a, a, a guy from Mexico, a guy from, white guy from, you know, Europe and a, a white, and a white woman. Uh, our, our company is, I think, at least, at least half of the company is are, are made up of folks of color, uh, and and that's pretty much that's 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 close to what our customer base looks like as well. So when we look at the teachers on the platform, uh, about fifty percent of our teachers are are uh, uh, Latin American women, and um, and you know the way we think about serving that customer base is we hire folks who speak Spanish, who can speak to them. We're making our product in, in multiple languages so that they're able to use the product. Uh, and it's a lot easier to execute on something like that when you have a diverse team that can, you know, um, execute on that. So, yeah, so that's how we, you know, that's how we've thought about it. It's really curious to watch your answer because you're sort of thinking about it and say, hey, yeah, it wasn't really a problem for us. And that's really, underscores just how important it is to have the role models, right? To have the uh, black CEOs. And that really does pull the diversity inclusion in the organization. So it's a ter terrific answer. Yeah. Um, the, same, the, same thing applies, the same thing applies to, you know, when I see a company that started with white founders, um, it's so important that they prioritize diversity early in building their company, because if they don't, if their first 10 or 15 employees all happen to be white, it just, it, 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 it makes it so much harder downstream to try to like, when, you know, you know, and I, I've talked to a number of founders who, who, who missed on, on diversity hiring early on, they just messed up. And when, and now when they, now when they're genuinely saying this is important, it's hard because someone's going to look at the page. Someone's going to look at who they're interviewing with, who they're working with, and 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 and, and the networks that they're hiring from. And and I think that's part of the challenge that's happening, you know, at startups, but at venture firms and at companies all over, is the the challenge of of not not thinking about or building a diverse team from day one. All right. Well, let me let me try one last question. We just have a couple of minutes. Um, we have I, I, I was told almost 2000 people uh, listening right now. So it's a really amazing platform. And and uh, there's a lot of privilege in this room or in this in this community. I mean, and, and some of it, it's not all white privilege just by being here. We're privileged. Right. Being here at Wharton, having been connected to Wharton. But there is a lot of white privilege for sure. And the question, let's start with you, Chris. In concrete terms, uh, what can we do? 
Like what can what can somebody who really has enjoyed a lot of privilege do? And uh, and and wire wire and hire that I, 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 that's that's awesome. But let's go one level beyond. Not everyone is in a position to wire and hire. So what what can we do? What's the call to action for this community? <laughs> You know, I I I I, I struggle I, I struggle with this question and I struggle with the answer. I one of my closest friends from high school, you know, he's on the he's on the partner track to at Cooley, you know, and he's gonna be a partner one day at Cooley, and and he he he's a white guy, oh, and he and he asked me the same question, <laughs> and I remember thinking like. I was like, I, I don't know, just use your power. R recognize that you have power. Recognize that you have power. Recognize that you can, you can speak up for, uh, you know, someone who doesn't look like you in the, in, in leadership team meetings. You can speak up for someone who doesn't look like you in hiring, in promotions, in, in mentoring. Um, uh, but... I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a really tough question. It's a really tough question. Yeah, no, that's good. That's a good answer. That's a great answer. You, you recognize your power and use it. That's a good, good answer. Okay, Josh, you had a little warning. Same question to you in a minute or less. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I'm not sure I have the answers. Um, what I do know, I think one of the realizations I came to in the last year is that the ultimate form of privilege is being able to only think about race and racism when it's convenient to you. Um, and, 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 and the ultimate privilege that I and other white people have is that we don't have to think about this every day. And that is hard, you know, and, and whereas, you know, you know, Chris and black founders have to deal with this, this is their life. And so I think that for me, what I think could be the most powerful is not to take advantage of that privilege, not to check in when this is convenient, check in when it's in the moment, um, but it's actually doing the work that's necessary to make you know, to leverage your platform, leverage your um, you know your your network to make change that's not in the headlines and when it's not convenient. Um, um, so that, that's, I think, part of the lesson that I learned this year. Okay, great. Well, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but that was a good covering of the landscape. So, Erica, back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carl. Fascinating to be on the listening end of this conversation. And as we close things out today, I just want to thank Chris and Josh, your candor, your willingness to share your experiences, to uh, communicate what life is like as both the funder of entrepreneurs and black entrepreneurs and what it is like to be a black entrepreneur. Clearly there's so much opportunity and work to continue and the Wharton School certainly is, is pleased to be able to play a small role uh, in that future of black entrepreneurship. Please join us again for the second of our Beyond Business series, which will take place on November 10th at 4.30 p.m. That conversation will be race and corporate power. Again, looking at the philanthropic opportunities that many companies and CEOs have pledged towards creating more racial equity in the U.S. At that session, we will be joined by the CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, Wes Moore, and my Wharton colleague, or Penn colleague, Kat Rosqueda, who will serve as the facilitator for the discussion with our audience. Until then, enjoy. Thank you again, Carl, Chris, and Josh. Really such a pleasure uh, to have this conversation and be in dialogue with all of you. And what a great auspicious start we have for this series.